over the last couple of days, for those who have been following it a little bit, um, I feel rather depressed. I don't know how you feel. Uh, all these images of dead apes and other wildlife uh, trends that are going down. Anybody who is optimistic about the future, raise your hands. Oh, wow. I just thought everybody would be as depressed as me. Anyway, <laughs> I'm going to tell you a story for those who are depressed of a little hope. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about uh, protected areas. And can protected areas protect great apes? And my emphatic answer is absolutely yes. And um, my story of hope starts in the Central African Republic. And I don't know if there's anybody here in the room who speaks Sango, but um, yes, you do, I know. Um, but the name of the country in Sango is Mbeti Africa, which means heart of Africa, for the obvious reason, like it's smack in the middle of Africa. But it's also, um, it stole my heart, because it's an amazing place um, to work in, and I was very fortunate in my career to get there. But uh, more importantly also for my personally, I met my wife there. And so it's always been a special place for me. And it's been uh, important for our family so that uh, we named uh, our son Ndoki after the Zangandoki National Park. The southern sector is called Ndoki, which by the way also means witchcraft, but he doesn't know that. <laughs> I uh, worked there and was fortunate enough to um, be working in the national park, helping to manage it, um, basically functioning as the warden of the park. And that entails, in a modern day national park, a lot of things that they don't teach you in school. I'm a biologist by background, wildlife management. But I learned to uh, use an AK-47, which was something that I completely adhore to. But uh, nevertheless, um, I now know how they function. And more unfortunately, I know how they sound. Um, we also, I got involved in human resource management, construction, all kinds of things that I would have never dreamt of doing. But one of the things that I did dream of doing was habituating lowland gorillas. I started a uh, lowland gorilla habituation program for tourism in an area called Baihoku. And I was very fortunately that after several years working there, we succeeded in doing so. And I think what is even more amazing is that program, which we started in the mid 90s, is still continuing today. And uh, largely due to people like um, Chloe Cipolletta, who was in that picture, but better here. Um, she's an amazing, amazing primatologist who uh, I hired to run the uh, gorilla habituation program. And she continued to stay there for many, many years. And she has been an incredible inspiration for the many students and volunteers who came through that program. And uh, a lot of people have worked it by Hoku, and some of them are here in this room. Um, and I think it's, it's been a place that has inspired many people to, show, to follow a career in conservation, which I think is, is incredible. But more important even are these people. These are the Baka, the trackers, who made it actually possible to do the gorilla habituation. People like uh, Niele, Mapoko, and in particular Wanga, who I will always remember for his incredible storytelling and mimicking of animals and people, which always make us laugh out loud, rolling over the floor, literally. Um, and it was a great experience for me to have that, that opportunity. So that, that, is, that sounds all great. But the Central African Republic, as some of you might know, um, is actually located, guess where, Central Africa. But it's also a completely failed state. There has been incredible insecurity since the mid-90s, just when I arrived there and started the tourism program, many people have asked me, why did you start? Well, it used to be one of the most stable countries in Central Africa, but it all went south. Uh, literally, we have had many coup d'etats, many mutinies, and at the moment it's, again, in an incredible flux. So you would think, you know, doing all this violence, mutinies in a country which has extreme poverty, um, how would great apes fare? Well, the surprising answer is actually quite well. Uh, that shows that actually population has remained more or less stable over the years. Um, so, and that is, I think, the main reason for that is people. I showed you the trackers, but it's also illustrated by the Zanga Zanga project, which was started in 1989 by visionary people, uh, conservationists like my friends and mentor, 
uh, Gustav Dungube, who's Central African, and Richard Carroll, some of you who might know him, a uh, well-known primatologist, who started this program. And they hired rangers, local people who were hired to protect the forest. When they started there, there was a lot of poaching going on, uh, particularly of elephants. And it's, uh, the area is very well known for the Dzangabai. Many filmmakers, I don't know if there's anybody here in the cell, but BBC, Geo, National Geo, many people have been there and done stories on this area. Um, and these guys were put to work. And this is the results for over the years. Over, well over a thousand guns taken out of circulation, 10,000 rounds of ammo, and what I find the most amazing, over half a million cable snares taken out of the forest. And if you consider that these are cable snares, these snares stay out till they ca basically catch something. So you can imagine how many animal lives have been saved because of this. And these guys are incredibly dedicated. You might ask, you know, maybe Zanga Sanga is just a fluke. We were lucky. Well, I think over the last couple of days we have heard a lot about what I always call uh, Africa's Yellowstone, Vrunga National Park, because it's the oldest, the most biodiverse, and probably the most important protected area in, uh, in Africa. And uh, same si situation there. Um, so over the last couple of days, some minor people have already talked about this, but it's been a success story. I mean, mountain gorillas have been protected. And it's largely due to people who are now there, like Eman Imeldemir Rode, uh, who is the warden with all his rangers, who are putting daily their lives on the line. And I think for me, these people have been the real inspiration. These people who are there working, and I hope they will be an inspiration for you. Their courage to go out in the field against well-armed poachers every single day and continue in doing this, even generation after generation in the case of the Virunga. Those are the real conservation heroes, and we should think about it and take courage from their commitments. They are the boots on the ground who make the difference, and they are the ones that are really important. So thank you very much. Thank you, Allard. And I actually can personally attest to what a wonderful job you did in Bioku because I had the good fortune of going there several years ago. And um, I, too, was very inspired by, by Chloe and her team. My next speaker, who joins me now, is uh, Tara Stowinski. And like many of us, uh, she was inspired by uh, Diane Fossey. But unlike many of us, she actually followed in those, uh, those footsteps quite literally. Um, Tara has studied gorillas for almost two decades, and she is now the Vice President and Chief Scientific Officer for the Diane Fossey Gorilla Fund. So welcome, Tara. Thank you. I don't know how many of you have had that opportunity to realize um, that you are living your dream, but I have been extremely lucky to have that opportunity and also to get a photo of it. Um, so this is about a decade ago when I got the real privilege to start working with wild gorillas, um, and not just any population of gorillas, but the Karasoki gorillas made so famous by Diane Fossey, and not any individuals. This is Titus, um, who has been studied by many people in this room. Um, he's probably one of the most famous famous gorillas in the world. He actually has a movie named after him that showed last night. Um, and so what I want to do is use Titus's story as kind of a backdrop to talk about mountain gorilla conservation and really focus on the lessons that we have learned for being on the, from being on the ground now for 46 years. And I really want to emphasize that those lessons have come through the help of so many people that are in the room. This is not just our work, but there are a lot of people that have contributed, in particular to the Diane Fossey Gorilla Fund, but also to mountain gorilla conservation in general. So our story, of course, starts with Diane, and I know many of you are familiar with her story. She went to Africa in 1967 to study gorillas. Just to reference people, there are two populations of mountain gorillas. Diane worked with the Virunga population, and you can see where Karasoki is on the Rwandan side of the gorilla's habitat. Diane originally went to study behavior, but it quickly became very apparent um, of the great crisis that the gorillas were facing with poaching and other threats to their environment. And so in 1978, she started the Digit Fund to start funding active conservation patrols to do things like remove snares and get cattle that were grazing in the park uh, removed. Unfortunately, this got her a lot of enemies, and in 1985, she was killed at her cabin in Karasoki. 
Her organization, though, has continued on, and the Digit Fund was renamed in her honor in the terms of the uh, Diane, named the Diane Fossey Gorilla Fund. And so from this fairly small footprint in uh, the Rwandan um, jungle, we now have this organization. This is our staff in Rwanda. We employ over 120 staff in Rwanda, and they are in the, on the ground 365 days of the year, protecting a, um, a fourth of the remaining Virunga population. And so because we've been there for four decades, I think people, it's a, it's a good opportunity to look and see what's working. We've heard a lot, we heard from Emma earlier about what's working. We need to be making sure that our efforts are really having the success that we want them to. And I think the best thing is this graph that we've seen multiple times, that the mountain gorilla population is increasing. Um, and so what lessons have we learned from this increase? Um, what lessons have we learned from the field over the last four decades? Well, the first thing, we've we learned a lot of lessons about gorilla behavior, both the general public um, through images that so many of your organizations have shared over time, and also the scientific community. Um, so we've learned that gorillas are not what we used to think. They are not savage beasts, but actually that they are gentle giants. That's a more appropriate terminology. Where males are more likely to be seen babysitting than they are to be seen fighting. We've learned that they live in very close-knit families like our own and they fight like we do, and they also make up like we do. We've learned about the incredible investment and patience that females put into their offspring to have babies that are as cute as this. We've learned what they eat. We've learned where they range. And we've learned that there is a lot about guerrilla societies that applies to human societies as well. So we've learned that it's very important to have friends. It's important to follow a good leader. It's important to respect your neighbors, even if they look a little bit different than you do. It's important to find time to play, to find time to rest, and gorillas are very good at that, uh, and to enjoy a good view sometimes. But all anthropomorphism aside, what we've learned from these studies, and I'm going to go back to this repeatedly, is really important information about the basic biology of a species that is needed to do conservation. We need to know things about population growth rates, about their spatial requirements, about their social organizations, to know if our strategies are working and if we're having an impact. And I really want to emphasize that this data, these data are not static, that these, we can't just go in, get some information, and then decide how we're going to conserve a species, because things change. This is a recent intergroup interaction, and this is not something you would have seen in Diane Fossey's time. You can see all of these silver backs here. And what we're finding is that these groups are much larger now than they were in the time of Diane Fossey, and they're much more multi-male. So we recently had a group that had 13 males in it. And so what does this mean for the dynamics of the population, and what does this mean for conservation? These are questions we need to continue to answer. We've also learned that it takes a village. I think um, from the stories we know of Diane, she would have been very happy to stay on top of the mountain by herself, but that's not the way that conservation works. Um, our village is definitely centered around our staff. This is Felix Ndajimana. He is the current Diane Fossey. I know he looks a little bit different than her, but um, he's the Karasoki director. He w became the first Rwandan director in January of 2012. And Felix oversees an incredible field staff of 70 people that are, again, these 70 people are in the forest every day. They are paramilitary trained, and they monitor 10 groups of gorillas that total 120 individuals. So every day they're there watching the gorillas, protecting them, and collecting that very valuable data that I was mentioning earlier. In addition to our guys that are actually physically with the guerrilla groups, we also have anti-poaching um, teams that go and do sweeps of the forest to look for evidence of illegal activities and also remove snares. Um, and we do this in conjunction, very, work very closely with the National Park Authorities, and I'd like to recognize Dr. Tony Mutakikwa, who's one of our main partners in Rwanda and works with the Rwandan Development Board. Um, last year, working with RDB, we removed over 1,700 snares from the forest. Um, our village also involves all of the people working on the ground with us. So this is our staff working with RDB staff, with the National Park staff, who is our primary partner in Rwanda. But also we work very closely with other NGOs. And so this is a team um, working with the gorilla doctors. They're about to go in and do um, an intervention to remove a snare on a gorilla. But our village also involves those individuals that are outside of the forest. We can't just work inside the forest. And so this is our conservation education manager, Joseph Karama. He last year did over, reached over 1,700 school children that live in this area right beside the Virungas, which we know has some of the highest uh, human population density in Africa. 
So going out and doing conservation education work, science literacy work, and also just getting kids out in nature. Even though these children live next to a national park, many of them have not spent any time in it or understanding it. We're also committed to, to furthering the next generation of conservation biologists and work very closely with the National University of Rwanda, and also building the capacity of our staff. We've sponsored six of our staff to go on and get master's and PhD degrees. We also are very interested in helping the local human population on issues that are related to their well-being, in particular health. This is Ildefons. He is our um, ecosystem health manager, and he's getting a fecal sample from one of the local villagers. About 95% of the population here is infested with uh, intestinal parasites, which obviously has an impact on their health, but also the health of the gorillas, because it's something that can be transmitted. And in, over the last decade, we've actually helped one of the local clinics treat over 100,000 people for intestinal parasites. And then infrastructure projects, such as building uh, latrines at local schools, helping to rehabilitate health clinics. This health clinic sees almost 20,000 people a year. It's right next to the forest. We've helped put in solar panels and uh, put in water cisterns. And so this fact that the village is not just inside the park, but also outside the park, has led to, uh, is reflected in our tagline, which is helping people, saving gorillas. Another lesson I think we've learned is the lesson of extreme conservation, with doc which Dr. Martha Robbins uh, talked about yesterday, and that's the amount of effort that it takes to change the trajectory for a species. So this is a paper that came out in 2011 that was a collaboration led by Martha, but involved national park staff, academic institutions, NGOs. And basically, the take-home story is that this is what's making the difference on the ground. That protected areas are extremely important, but they're not enough. And it's having those boots on the ground that has turned the tide for mountain gorillas. And I think the important point here is that the Virungas has 20 times the global um, average of field staff. This is the type of effort that we're going to need to help these species. And then finally, I think it's really important to realize that this success is fragile. What I like to say is that we've won um, some battles, but we have not yet won the war. So we all, so I'll show this graph again, and we all love it to see this wonderful increase in the Virunga gorilla population. But I think it's important to remember what's been happening to the human population in that region over the same time. So a much more significant increase in the human population. And if we put gorillas on, um, on here, you can see where the gorilla density is down there at one, as compared to six to 700 people per square kilometer um, that are right around this park. So very, very high human population densities, um, very small area that is left for these animals, um, surrounded by a, pea, a sea of people, as Annette said earlier. And so what this means is as this population is increasing, it actually doesn't have the ability necessarily to spread out. And so this is, again, where those long-term data become important because we can look at um, you know, how many groups were ranging in an area in 2000 compared to 2008. And you can see we have three times the number of groups in the same area. And we just finished a study in conjunction with Max Planck where we looked at vegetation changes. And we compared the vegetation biomass in the 1980s to what we're seeing now. We've actually seen a 50% decline in gallium, which is the gorilla's favorite food item. There's also no buffer zone. So here you can see the edge of the park. You've got a park on one side, and you've got people and livestock just on the other side. And unfortunately, that buffalo wall does not do a very good job of keeping gorillas in or keeping people out of the park. And so one of the new challenges we're facing is we're seeing gorillas spending a lot more time out of the park. This is not something that they had traditionally done a lot of. And so this is, um, increases their opportunity for exposure to uh, disease transmission for, from both humans and livestock. And it also increases the potential for wildlife human conflict. And this is a gorilla um, destroying a uh, eucalyptus tree, which is an um, important wood source for the local population. It also means that people go into the park and they set snares, not for the gorillas, but for ungulates. But unfortunately, gorillas can get caught in them. And because of the daily monitoring, because there are people there checking on every gorilla every day, most of the time we can deal with the situation and get the snares off. But it's not 100%. And in 2012 alone, three infant gorillas were lost to snare-related incidents. And you can imagine how much number that higher might be if those 1,700 snares had not been removed from the forest. Disease is a big issue. 70% of the Virunga population sees humans every single day. And even the pet trade and, and illegal traffic, trafficking is an issue. These are growers gorillas, but there are currently four mountain gorillas living in sanctuaries in uh, eastern DRC. 
And so, I, again, I just want to say I do think we're winning the battle, and I think we have a lot of reasons to be optimistic. It's great to have success stories, but we have not yet won the war. And I think that the gorillas and, and, the, and the human population will continue to look for, to us to continue to protect this population. And I just want to end by going back to Diane Fossey and the, and the difference that really one person can make. Her personal story and the way it was told by so many of the filmmakers and National Geographic and other people represented in the room really changed the trajectory. It changed the history of a species. And it really changed the life history for this individual. This is Titus. And we all want to save species. But at the end of the day, species are made up of individuals. And individuals like Titus all have their unique story. And we've been very lucky to be able to tell Titus' Titus's story, which is a story of tragedy, but then ultimately of triumph. And I'm hoping that we're able to, to generate interest in the next generation and make them want to conserve apes the way that Diane Fossey made me want to conserve apes. And in that way, we will have all of these descendants, these are all descendants of Titus, that they'll be able to tell their conservation story as well. Thank you. It can happen when the signs and media collide, of course. We, we thought of them as peace, and now we know these are gentle giants. And I'm so excited to be heading to your site uh, in November. Our next speaker is an amazing woman by the name of Claudine Andre. Um, she's known as a bonobo guardian. Uh, her love of bonobos led her to the development of Lola Ya Bonobo, a sanctuary which is now home to 67 bonobos. Um, please welcome Claudine as she tells you not only her inspiring story of how she got started, but also about the first ever release of bonobos back into the wild. Okay, hello, good afternoon. I'm sorry, I'm French speaking and thinking, so I cannot be so fast than Tara, and my apologize for this. So my story is a little bit different. I, I have a long story with DRC, former Zaire. I, am a, I, I arrive in, in this country when the time it was called Belgium Congo in 51 with my father who was a vet. And it's true, I was living in the same place than the Anfosse this period. And I remember in the 60s, the people find we are the two crazy women in the region. She was sleeping in the, in, with the gorilla and I was climbing the Virunga. And I didn't like to meet the gorilla when I go in the Virunga. So I have no problem with the Anfosse just when I was in near the Karisimbi or the Vizoke, I go to ask her where they are to don't meet them. So very, very different story. And after this, my, my life changed and I, I go to live in Kinshasa in 78. And strangely now, 40 years after, it's me who was running after orphan bonobo every day. So my story begins in Kinshasa when we enter in a very, very difficult period in 90, 91, 93. All the town of Congo was destroyed by the population and by military who loot everything. And I go, I don't know, I met someone and say, someone tell me, did you go to the zoo? And I say, the zoo resist in this. I just left my husband who lose his company and uh, I pushed the door in the, uh, of the zoo and there my life changed. I, I see there a lot of animals, but also 30 person who was waiting, I don't know why, without hope. And so I go to the zoo and I save the zoo and very quick, I. I collect a first baby bonobo and a second one because at this time we enter in a new war, new rebellion, and I begin, perhaps we can call a um, nursery sanctuary in my garage, and after in a clinic, and after in the American school, and finally I create Lola Ya Bonobo, in where we rescue the poor orphan bonobo from the bushmeat on the street of Kinshasa. And there I realized that I have to work with the local authorities, with the official people from the Ministry of Environment to reinforce the law and protect this very precious 100% Congolese species. 
It's the same moment we go on the bush meat market because we are at the last, the last chain of the bush meat. So we go everywhere, make study with my staff on bush meat in the market of Kinshasa. So I will not speak about what is the sanctuary. Thanks to Julie Sherman Udu, our director executive of PASA. Lola Yabonobo is one of the founder members of PASA. And Julie explained extremely, extremely, extremely well sorry, what we are doing in sanctuary as re, 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 um, ability rehabilitation, some words are really difficult in English, rehabilitation, education, study of species, and 10 years later, and perhaps 18 bonobo later, I begin to dream to release bonobo in the wine. And this is a very, it's a difficult period for us to prepare this, because you have to find um, a release site, you have to follow the st strictly the guidelines of IUCN in reintroduction of gray tapes. But after three years, I find a site in the landscape Maringa Lopori Wamba, coordinated by AWF in this period, Jeff Dupin. And I find a very good place near the river Lopori, 20,000 hectares, and I decide to go to reintroduce a group well rehabilitated of bonobo. And I go to the first reintroduction of bonobo in the world. For sure, is a great challenge in front of you when you do this. Not only with all the scientific preparation veterinarians preparation, but working with the local communities. After two decades of wars, rebellion, reunification, these people are really, really poor. And to, to go and reintroduce bonobos in their land, we have to speak a lot, a lot, until we make an agreement together. And we did with the chief, for sure, with the population, for sure. But we realized that we have to, to help these people to put a step in front of the step after the war. We, re we reorganized them in Committee for Development of Village. As you know, a village, a Congolese village, turned around for Paul, the church, the school, the market, and the dispensary. So with this, this help of this committee of development village, we know better what they are waiting, what it, it's they wait for the future. And we have staff who visit them every month, and every quarter we met a big meeting where we share every problem with the local community and the six Committee of Development of Village. It's what we call a cadre de concertation. Every four months is enough. One year is too much, and the problems stay too much between us. So four months is a bad, a, a good, uh, a good period. So we help them. We bring book school for the teachers. We we manage maternities for women. Four. We bring them recently a dentist, and I can tell you that after 20 years to have a dentist with anesthetic, she, the people kiss her hands. <laughs> so it's, we work like this, 80% of, of our time it's to manage the local communities and work well with them. But the second challenge when you go to reintroduction you have a lot of challenge, I told you. But it's education and sensibilization about not only the species, but the biodiversity in, in general. It's a non-stop work about sensibilization and education. And 
and it's work. It's perhaps why is the motto of my association, Conservation Begin by Education. This story is a nice story, by the way. Last October, a hunter called with a, <laughs> he paid the HF, HF radio to someone who can telephone to her and say, okay, I have in my snare an adult female bonobo and I don't want to kill her because he was in the landscape and he had this sensibilization and he can, he, we organized a long, long trip for, to pick the one we call Bolomba. And she go two years, uh, two days on a, on a motorbike and after in the pirogue and after uh, a plane to Kinshasa. And it's work, education. But my dream is to see, for sure, reintroduce more bonobo to be free in the wild. Not only like in Lola, to be the last ambassador for the last free bonobo in the wild, but to have the chance to return them to the forest. Thank you. I would like to introduce our next speaker, uh, actually, uh, Dominique Bicaba. Uh, he is the executive director of Strong Roots and has an extensive background in conservation and development for more than 15 years now. So please welcome to the stage, Dominique. Thank you very much. I feel um, fortunate for being born in an area that I think is the most important in this world, the system DRC. Because at the same time, we have successful stories, but also we have challenges, and we, start, we try to cope in both. And we are happy, because we hope that tomorrow that can change. I remember I was two years old when my grandmother took me out of my parents, and I stayed with her. I was born in the forest that is called today the Kahuzbiga National Park. And as you know, it's the only area where the Eastern Lowland gorillas live or in the region. And what she did, she used to take me in the forest and stay there for many hours a day. And she could tell me, when you see a path like that, that means a dangerous animal has passed there. When you see a path like this, it's an antelope, or you can use this tree for this, you can use plant for this. And at the same time, the government of Zaire at the time was pushing people out of the forest because it was already a national park. Our communities and the pygmy communities all were obliged to go out of the forest. And unfortunately, the pygmies couldn't have access, access to land, and until now they don't have right to land but we, do, we did have access to land. But at that time as well, the pygmies were secretly entering the forest and poaching and coming back in our village and exchanging the bush meat with crops like banana, beans, and so on. And in 1992, when we saw these conflicts growing, growing, we set up a local organization to tackle these conflicts between the communities around the park and um, the, 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 the park management. And I worked for this organization for the last 15 years until um, I moved to another organization that I've been working on for the last five years. So what we do in our projects is all about what can be done with the communities to engage in sustainable conservation on biodiversity, not only for the park, but in their areas. And I would like actually to point um, the photo in the, in the right, up uh, right, uh, this, she is a pygmy woman. And at one time, the park management recruited pygmy men and said, they are poaching, so let's take them in, uh, in, 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 in uh, let's give them a job, and by then, we can reduce poaching on the park. But what they were doing, 
They were telling their wives, we are patrolling north today, so we can go to hunt thaws. So the park management, the park rangers, and the pygmies, the new recruit pygmies, were patrolling in the north, and one week or two weeks later, they come back in the south sector. They meet a lot of traps, a lot of hunting, and say, what's this? We've already recruited the people who are doing this. But it took us 13 months to collect $2,000 to start a program with those pygmies. And so we start the program that poaching by pygmy women decreased. We continued with them. The other one down there, she is um, a pygmy also. People are saying, you are changing the culture of the pygmies. We understand. I grew up with pygmies. I know that they rely on forest. But now it's a problem, it's a case of humanity. They don't have choice. We've been renting 40 hectares every year for them to grow beans and corn because that's the only one way instead of stealing in other people's crops. Environmental education program is not just education. If we see from Jackson Hall to here, in all the sessions we are talking about corruption, 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 corruption. But how do we fix that? If we don't fix it, that will remain a limit, a barrier for conservation and for the survival of great apes. We need it. education is a key. And not just education. We need education that drives responsibilities. And the responsibility is that promote values. That's only one way we can remove that problem. Um, challenges, yes. Success, also, yes. The park has lost, the highland part of the park has lost half of the population of gorillas, where the lowland part of the park. Uh, in the mid-90s, they were counting about 15,000 individuals, and now in 2008, um, WCS published a report where they only found 77 individuals in the lowland part of the park. I don't know where we are going, how we are doing it. Then we got, in, uh, we got interested in the, the non-protected forest that is between the Kahosbiega and the Itombe forest. And between them, we have these three main forests, that's Burhini, Luinde, Isopo, that are also home of great apes. And we said, we cannot leave that. Let's go there and see if the population that is in Itombe can use these populations that are in non-protected forests and Kahosbiega to create a corridor. Maybe that could work. And there we found successful stories from the communities, good ones and bad ones. But we have to rely on good ones because we are now documenting uh, traditional knowledge that they've been uh, playing to uh, protect those um, great apes in non-protect forest. The situation there again is complicated, but good because it's giving us lessons. We already have good experience from Kahusbiega. And as you can see up, that's all about conflicts, Min, uh, illegal mining, poverty, even to access water, clean water is a big deal. And if we can look in the area, Burhini alone, the yellow color, that means uh, people are exploiting minerals, gold over there. And the uh, gray one, that's uh, Casterite and, and, uh, and, and Colton. But these people in this area, whatever the poverty is, they don't need highways in the village. That will cost a billion and billion of dollars. They don't need to build airplanes in their village. They need just small, basic means of survival. Schools, small clinics, those things can make a difference. And we don't have, for the moment, palm oil plantations in the area. A little logging in Itombwe, but we can see how the forest is going. That's 15 kilometers from the palm, natural palm oil we can see here and the edge of the forest. And that have been for 
actually 15 years. So that means a kilometer per year. We need to unite efforts together to make sure we can, we can protect, we can work for sustainable conservation of great apes. Governments have been blaming communities. You are pushing. And the community is blaming the government. You confiscate our lands. We understand. Researchers publishing all the reports and media getting that to the public. Good. Donors, we just, we just came from a session where we see how complicated it is. From donors to the people in need, policies in giving money. It's complicated at all levels. But can we change that equation? It's possible to get everybody together and change the way we are doing. Maybe we are doing a wrong way in conservation because communities say, I mean in ranch countries, the developed countries have imposed us a way of conserving our forests and our great apes. And the, develop, the developed countries say, you poor countries, you are destroying the forest because you are poor. Let's collaborate instead of blaming each other and we can make a change for great apes. Thus, I'd say that although those challenges are, we have hope. People are being empowered through education. People are being uh, empowered through um, themselves, talking with them, empowering them through conservation projects, development projects. And as a people, as my grandmother inspired me because I believe I'm what she wants me to be. But we have Pili Pili, this pygmies, and the reason I put this photo here is because this man has empowered, has empowered international people, has empowered his own colleagues, he's empowered children, and he's empowered communities. This is the first person who has habituated, human, uh, habituated gorillas to human presence in Kahoos Big National Park, that between uh, 1972 to 1973. I believe that if we go, we empower communities, not just consulting them and saying, this is what we are going to do. Because the future of great apes requires its capacities, the support, its engagement of everybody, of all groups in a given society. That's the only one way I think we can save the gorillas. And also, knowing that we cannot save great tapes without saving, saving communities. And by saving communities, that's only one way we can save great tapes. Thank you. My introductions are having to get shorter and shorter uh, for time reasons. Uh, so next up is Dr. Michelle Goldsmith, who is an associate professor. Um, she began starting her work with gorillas in the 90s in CAR, studying the behavioral ecology of Western lowland gorillas. She went to Bwindi in 1996 and in 1999 began studying the impacts of ecotourism on the Incongoro group. So please put your hands together for Michelle. Thank you. Wow, it's really a pleasure to be um, up here sharing my passion with so many other people who share the same passion. In fact, from what I could see in the audience, almost all of you share the same passion. Um, my tale is one of uh, a cautionary tale. A lot of us have been talking about saving uh, great apes, and this is, of course, about saving mountain gorillas, but again, in a, in a cautionary way. And my story um, kind of starts with Diane Fossey's story, like so many of you who've been influenced by these pioneering women in the field. Um, Diane actually came to my school when I was a sophomore in college and um, proceeded to give a slideshow. This was one of her slides. Um, she was talking about her favorite gorilla, Digit, who was one of the first gorillas to actually come out and touch her. Digit was kind of a misfit of the group, and Diane at the time was actually thought of as kind of a misfit at the time. And they kind of got together, and they had a very, very special bond. And at the time that Diane was working in this area, she struggled with a lot of problems, a lot of challenges, one of which was the killing of the gorillas for their heads as trophies, their hands for ashtrays. This isn't actually a mountain gorilla hand. This is actually the hand of a western lowland gorilla taken by Carl Amann. 
Um, I couldn't find one on uh, Google in the last minute that I had to, to show it. But basically, this was happening. Um, the gorillas were being killed, and the bodies were actually being left behind, and um, pieces were taken. And she went on through her presentation. You know, a bunch of us were sitting in, in the audience. A lot of us were crying by this point. And then she showed this as her last slide. And I know you actually just saw this in Tara's presentation, and you might have seen this slide before. This slide's taken by Dr. Ian Redman. And this is Digit with his head and his hands and his feet cut off. And by this time, everyone's bawling. <laughs> and, um, and the reason she has a sign saying why Rwanda is because it was illegal, of course, to kill gorillas at this time, but the government wasn't doing anything about it at all, and she was losing the fight. So anyone who studies biology or um, anyone who understands how sympathy works when two species share the same environment um, and may even say, uh, share the same niche, they have competitive exclusion. And whenever one species has a slight advantage over the other, then they're the ones that actually win. So when it comes to the interaction between humans and non-human animals, humans always win. And this is what Diane learned very quickly, and what all of us as conservation biologists learn very quickly, and what we struggle with. The Mountain Gorilla Program, um, in order to help create a situation to protect these gorillas, started a tourism program. A tourism program that was hoping to be a win-win program. Take the poachers, turn them into rangers, involve the local community, make the gorillas worth more alive than dead. And it, as everyone has said, in, not only in these presentations here, just in this session, but in all the presentations that you've been hearing over the past three days, this has been a really successful project and has definitely saved these gorillas from what was probably a near extinction. This uh, program took part in the Virungas. Many of you have seen this map already. The Virungas is down in the north, and that's where Diane Fossey was doing her work. There's another uh, population of mountain gorillas up in Buindi that most of you know about now. Uh, Dr. Martha Robbins has been working there now for 15 years. I started working there in 96. And we're getting to know a lot more about these gorillas, but they're not as well known as the Virunga population. But what um, Buindi wanted to do was they wanted to copy the model, uh, the Virunga model. And in 1991, they were gazetted a national park. And in 1993, they started their tourism program. When I originally went to Buindi, I came over from the Central African Republic, where before Allard um, started his habituation program, I worked for uh, on and off for five years, two years straight, in the field studying unhabituated gorillas. I came back to my office after some long field work, and on the door, instead of saying primatologist, it actually said scatologist. Because when you study unhabituated gorillas, what you do is you spend a lot of time tracking them the day after, following their nests, um, collecting dung, cleaning the dung, seeing what's in the dung to determine their diet. And this is what I did for two years for my dissertation work. And my idea and my plan for my dissertation was to do a comparative study between the lowland gorillas and the mountain gorillas as kind of a natural, uh, naturalistic experiment. At the time, Rwanda was closed, so I ended up staying in CAR for a little bit longer than I thought I would. Bwindi is 25 kilometers um, south of the Virungas. You could actually see the Virungas in the, in the background here. And when I went, I started working with wonderful people there. Um, this was in 96. And for a few years, I tried to do the comparative study of um, behavioral ecology with the mountain gorillas. And uh, I remember I would go up, I, the mountain gorillas would be right there and I'd be sitting there and it would be very interesting and everything and then the gorillas would move off and then I'd get to the nest and I'd actually collect dung and I would get so excited and I'd collect hair and get so excited and I remember my field assistant looking at me at the time and saying, what's wrong with you? You know, you just sat here and watched the gorillas and there was like no awe, but here you're at the nest collecting dung and all of a sudden you're so excited. Because this is what I did for, you know, five years over in the Central African Republic didn't really get to see very many gorillas. I could have been studying really large squirrels for all I knew. So it was a very different experience. But what we soon discovered, um, and these are some of the guys that worked with me. In, in, over here is um, Everest. He worked with me. He started with, working with me when he was 14. 
Um, he's now 30, has a few kids, and he actually um, grew up into the project and actually headed the project for us after a while. Um, some of you might know Arthur also, he actually runs the, he just opened a new school for orphans in Incoringo as well. So without the Ugandan Wildlife Authority and without the rangers and the people on the ground, none of this work is possible. So it wasn't very soon after starting in Bwindi that I realized I really wasn't going to be able to do the comparative scientific study that I wanted because within the first year that I was there, collecting daily GPS every 100 meters as I was following the group, I found that the gorillas weren't living in the park. Uh, I know Liz McPhee had, had talked about this and the pressures of gorillas living outside the park. Would tourists even want to come in to see the gorillas if they're living outside the park? So in 1999, well actually in 2001, because after the massacre in 1999, um, when I came back in 2001, I started looking directly at the, um, at the impacts of ecotourism on gorilla behavior and ecology in the Incaringo area, on the Incaringo group, which was not habituated for tourism at the time, but was habituated at, for research, which is what I was doing. And if you could see just in this picture, and, and as you've seen in some other slides, the gorillas were spending, um, at this point, 70% of their time outside the park. Um, comparative data now is close to 85 to 90 percent of their time outside the park. And this is the reason why I think um, Gladys might have shown a picture like this earlier. Uh, and I think we also just saw one from the Virungas, is there are very little buffer zones around this area. And in Karinga there actually is a buffer zone. But because we didn't cut down the crop trees in the buffer zone, the gorillas just moved back into the buffer zone and now move continuously outside the buffer zone. And this is what the gorillas do. So this is a cautionary tale because we have seen the successes of tourism and we have seen that a lot of people are talking about mountain gorillas as the model program to use in all other cases. But there are some challenges and some of my colleagues have already talked about some of these challenges. In fact, Tara already mentioned some of them. Um, but in one year, um, I have data, and just in one year of gorillas, this one gorilla group, decimating 90 eucalyptus trees. Eucalyptus trees are very important for the livelihood of the people in this area for charcoal and wood. Um, they're fast growing, but um, they die pretty fast when the gorillas strip them. This is a banana tree, um, a banana plant. Unlike Megilla gorilla, you know, who went around and plucked bananas off trees, gorillas actually destroy the banana plant. And in one year, I have gorillas destroying this one group over 800 banana plants. So when the gorillas are outside the park, they are considered pests and they do have problems uh, both directly and indirectly with uh, farmers. Um, and as many of my colleagues have already said, there's uh, a large issue with transmission of diseases. And it's not really transmission of disease through tourists, which is a major impact, but it's transmission of disease with the local community. As some have said, we have some of the largest population densities living around these parks. And although the gorilla doctors do a great job, um, we have still lost quite a few gorillas to measles. Um, the last um, two deaths were also due to human-induced, you know, the viruses that were not previously found in the gorillas before, human viruses, um, and scabies, as you might have heard, um, also. So this is one of the really big problems that we're dealing with now is um, over-habituation. And so if there's any kind of solutions I'd like to offer, that is to help train rangers to somehow um, have the gorillas understand that this just is not acceptable behavior. I just got back from the field in January where I did some interviews with tourists and I interviewed about 28 tourists and every single tourist that came back, I asked them, I said, do you expect to touch a gorilla? And none of them expected to touch a gorilla, but almost all of them expected to be touched by a gorilla because this went viral. This was on Good Morning America as the, you know, the, uh, what is it, play of the day. Um, and we know that, you know, this is a major problem. So in Buindi, um, we started in 1993. We had two groups habituated. Through the years, we've been habituating more and more groups. And what I would like to just caution is that the groups, it's almost 40% of the population or a little bit more, is that given all these caveats and given all of these potential risks, 
that we really need to be careful. And um, I ask again that maybe there's consideration to maybe stop habituating groups um, at this point, that we have enough habituated groups at this point. Um, this is the Clouds Lodge right outside of Incaringo. It's $900 a night to stay at this lodge. And this is the Incaringo Village right outside the lodge. And no running water, um, no sanitation, no electricity. And, you know, tourism was started as a win-win. We've heard that the numbers are increasing. We've heard some positive, really wonderful stories. So again, this is just a cautionary tale that we maybe need to take less of an anthropocentric approach and maybe take more of a biocentric approach and consider these animals for their intrinsic value um, and look at tourism as a conservation tool and not forget that it is a conservation tool. And as Diane said, when you realize the value of all life, you dwell less on what is past and concentrate on the preservation of the future. And this is Posho. He's uh, actually just left the group uh, about a year ago, uh, the Incaringo group. And this is his life. This is what he sees generally on his daily ranging patterns. Um, and this is the village of Incaringo. So, thank you. Our last speaker is Rolf Scar. He is the Forest Campaign Director for Greenpeace. Um, Rolf leads initiatives uh, to achieve a bold vision. And I'm going to leave it at that, but this is a very different talk. <laughs> what a teaser. Great. What a teaser. Thanks, Maria. And thanks to the funders who made it possible for me to be here today. It's a real privilege to ask this question. As Monty Python once said, and now for something completely different. I'm not gonna be talking about the jungles and rainforests as much as I am about urban jungles and what we can do here to save uh, great apes from where we are. So I'm gonna start with the question, can candy bars save great apes? And I think it's obvious that on their own, of course not, but they can be a useful tool for us as conservation advocates. And to explain why I think so, I'm gonna start, give you a little more background about myself as a forest advocate. I've been doing forest conservation work for over 15 years. I started off here in the US working on federal forests. And looking back, I think it's something that I would now call traditional tree hugging. Because I was taught to use a toolbox that relied on regulation, on litigation, on petitioning politicians for better management of our forests. And as you can see from this slide and that monster old growth stump, it had mixed results. And it was often slow work. One step forward, one step back, winning some battles, losing some others, as I fought for hundreds of acres or thousands of acres at times of endangered forests. Sometimes these fights drug out in the courts for years, and sometimes decisions by politicians were reversed by the next election cycle. It was sometimes very frustrating work, to be frank, but it was what I knew and was what everyone else around me was doing, and things changed for me when I joined Greenpeace about six and a half years ago, First thing that changed was the size of the problem that I was asked to address. This is a shot of Sumatra, a picture I took from a small plane, and my jaw literally dropped. I was speechless. I'd seen a lot of forest destruction. I'd never seen anything on this scale before. Indonesia was recently given the, the world record for the worst deforestation rate by the Guinness Book uh, before I visited and took this uh, picture as well. And if you haven't seen it, there's been a lot of talk of it at this conference, you have to see it to believe it. Because as the plane went up into the sky and above even the clouds, it literally could not see the end of the destruction. And there simply is no future for the orangutan or other endangered species that rely on these rainforests without their homes. It's not only the direct impact of this devastating loss of habitat, but it's of course the trapping, the torture, the trade, and the killing that happens afterwards. So what to do? The tools I was taught in the past wouldn't work. I couldn't just petition the Indonesian government as an American, and I couldn't expect the Indonesian government to suddenly throw off all the corruption and suddenly magically have all the capacity they needed to do better land use planning and address what was going on in the field. We had to do something else. We had to look to the marketplace because all of those palm oil plantations weren't just popping up for no reason. They were popping up to sell palm oil to companies. Well, with some careful research, Greenpeace figured out where this stuff was going. It was going to make products that we all use, billions of people around the world use every day, soaps and shampoos and crackers and, yes, candy bars, with some of the largest consumer companies in the world, companies like Unilever and Nestle and Kraft and Procter and & Gamble. And so that we started talking to these companies and said, hey, you've got a problem in your supply chain and you have a responsibility to fix it. And unfortunately, the response from most of the companies at the start was like this. 
just to put their heads in the sand and pretend like it wasn't their problem. You know, that's just an externalized cost of our business. And maybe if we ignore it for long enough, Greenpeace will go away. Well, actually, this is the worst thing to do to make Greenpeace go away. Because if you put your head in the sand, you make yourself a very easy target for our campaigns. This is what it looks like. It's a very simple campaign plan, actually. We go to the marketplace, we use marketplace pressure to make you take responsibility for what you should. And let me um, just clarify something here. Markets campaigning has been going on for a long time, but this isn't the blunt instrument boycott campaigns of the 80s and 90s that you might have heard of. Look, if we're gonna take on Nestle, they have, at last count, 29 brands that make over a billion dollars a year for them. That's not something Greenpeace or any other NGO can put a dent in. But what we can do is attack something that's actually more valuable to them than next quarter's profits, and that is their brands. These are things that are much more vulnerable, vulnerable to us, especially in the world of social media, and it's something that uh, actually makes these issues interesting. It's a great entree to involve people. We keep telling, telling ourselves we need to educate people better and bring them in. Well, this is a great way to do that. Talk about the products that are literally in front of them. They may never go to a rainforest, but they can tell you uh, all about the products uh, like candy bars that are in front of them. So we, we had Nestle in a position where they had a head in the sand approach. Uh, we gave them a chance to fix it, they didn't, so we put out this report, caught red-handed, talking about how the palm oil they were using was killing orangutans in our climate. And we documented our careful research, going from the destruction up there, from the, w the largest palm oil producer in Indonesia, the Sinar Mas affiliate, through the traders like Cargill, to Nestle and their billion-dollar brands like Kit Kat. And then we took their brand and started spoofing it. We used the current ad campaign and made our own. We stood it on its head. When the board office worker cracks into the candy bar, instead of having chocolate, he has a bloody orangutan finger which drips all over his desk and shocks his coworkers. Yes, I can see people grimacing in the crowd. Exactly, it's shocking. But it got people's attention and it got Nestle's attention because they petitioned YouTube to pull it off of the web. Well, that was great for us because we got to then say, hey, look, watch the video that Nestle doesn't want you to see. And it started spiraling out of control for Nestle as they continued their head in the sand approach. It just fed into things. People were pissed off about the palm oil issue, but they're also angry about the sort of bullheaded and clumsy way that Nestle was handling this as well. And so their Facebook pages and their online social networks started to be filled with this stuff to the point where they had to stop posting on their Facebook page. We paralyzed their Facebook page, and these were the headlines that resulted from that. The Wall Street Journal, Nestle takes a beating on social network sites. And we're getting 100,000 views on the video in the first 24 hours and quickly shot over a million views. And then we got coverage that we don't normally get on our campaigns. It wasn't so much about our campaign and the issues, it was about how it was happening and playing out. And it turned into a top 10 corporate PR story in 2010. It made a lot of momentum, but it didn't just live online and in print. This was the scene at the Nestle annual shareholder meeting as people lined up for their free Nescafe coffee. These were uninvited orangutans. They were homeless. They had lost their habitat in Riau province, and so they relocated to Switzerland, and they decided to stay. Uh, they had nowhere else to be. They stayed so long, in fact, that police had to literally drag them away in handcuffs. And you can imagine, this sort of changes the flavor. When uh, you're going to a shareholder meeting, and it's supposed to be about you know, the future profit forecast, and you're watching people get dragged away and thrown into uh, cop cars. Now, it created quite a stir outside of the shareholder meeting, but inside, as activists repelled out of the rafters with the same messaging, Nestle give orangutans a break, uh, while the board president was giving his speech, uh, it also changed things in there. And the great thing about this was they're in a big conference hall, and they couldn't take our activists down without closing down the whole thing and moving everyone out. So they kept them up there. <laughs> the rest of the time. And as a result, the reporting was not so much about Nestle and its profits forecast. It was about Nestle has a problem. And did you see those activists? And what about the orangutans? Now, we also learned that to tackle a big company like Nestle, you can't think small. It can't be a couple of hippies like me in San Francisco wagging our fingers. It needs to be a truly international, coordinated uh, campaign. So on the same day that all of that was happening, uh, things were happening all over the world. This is a shot of an office building, a Nestle office building in Germany, which was redecorated. And for those folks in working for Nestle, you could still see out their windows, not behind our banner, they saw a huge truck outside with a giant LED screen with a live stream of Twitter comments from all over the world in different languages that streamed for eight hours the whole workday. They saw people all over the world say, Nestle, come on, get your act together, fix this problem. And after two months, 
they did, and they released the most comprehensive anti-deforestation policy for their commodities, the things that they buy in their supply chain, of any large consumer company. It's, it's truly a, a leading policy. And we went on to use similar tactics against other brands. I won't go into those stories. And a lot more orangutans got arrested. And I'm proud to say that as a result of all of that work, the largest palm oil producer in Indonesia uh, sat down with Greenpeace and came up with a policy to stop deforestation for its plantations. Now that had never been done before in Indonesia, and many of us didn't think it ever would happen. So sometimes pigs fly, and now what we're doing is two years into that implementation with the largest palm oil producer in Indonesia, we're coming up with new ways of doing palm oil business, of making palm oil work on the ground, and what we wanna do is actually spread that around. So it's not just one leader in an industry, but it's a new industry standard. And then that, in turn, can come back and create political space for the kinds of reforms and long-term solutions that we need the Indonesian government to participate in. So, in wrapping up, I'll say that we can do this. We can actually make a bright future for these animals. We can, we can get rid of the drivers of deforestation once and for all. It's going to mean throwing out some of our old thinking. It's going to mean not being afraid to rattle cages maybe getting arrested, maybe making some enemies in the process, but being proud of our work once it's done. And it may also mean being the 800 pound gorilla where we are. It might be that some of us can be the best conservation advocates for these gorillas and these orangutans and other great apes uh, right where we are and not in the, in the rainforest. So thanks very much. And I'll give it up to your host here. Thank you. I promised you it would be different. <laughs> um, thank you all very much. Field Notes session is now over. Uh, but again, thank you for joining us. And I really hope that you're all as inspired and, and as enlightened as, as I am. <laughs>